painted the skeleton on this side of the horse so that you can see the position of the bones. Start off with the position of the neck vertebra, which are probably much lower down than you would expect them to be. Also the position of the shoulder blade, and you can see why it's so important that when a saddle's fitted, it doesn't interfere with the movement of the shoulder blade. You can see the position of the thoracic vertebra, which will be under the saddle, and how close together the spinous processes are. And again, this is something that, needs, that you need to bear in mind when you're fitting a saddle. You have the lumbar vertebra, or the lower back, and then the pelvis, and you have the bones of the forelimb and the hind limb. On this side, we've painted the major muscle groups of the horse. The points in white are the major bony points that you can feel, and these are the points where the muscles attach to. The major muscles in the neck are all painted in different colours. The back muscle, the long back muscle in yellow, and the gluteal muscle, and the hamstring muscles. When we talk about developing a horse's top line, we're talking about correct development of these top line muscles so that your horse carries itself in a correct outline. And by doing this, you're avoiding the horse being ridden with a hollow back, which can lead to muscular problems throughout the back and skeletal problems. The horse is not designed to be ridden, and this yellow muscle is the long back muscle. And this has to support the weight of the rider and the saddle. And it's therefore important that your saddle is fitted correctly. It's also very important that you warm up properly before exercise, just as any athlete would do. When you start working a cold muscle, again, it becomes susceptible to muscle strains. At the end of an exercise, it's also important to cool down. Some muscular problems through the back may be secondary to problems in the lower limbs. This is because the horse will compensate and be susceptible to muscle strains throughout this long back muscle and the deeper back muscles. So for your horse's welfare and for a long and happy riding life, it's important to have his back regularly checked by a fully qualified practitioner that's recommended by your vet. Hello, I'm Dr. Roberta Dwyer. I'm a veterinarian at the Gluck Equine Research Center at the University of Kentucky. And what we're going to cover today is the general overall anatomy of the horse. Behind me is a horse skeleton that is almost totally complete. I will show you which bone is missing from this skeleton, but we're very lucky to have an entire skeleton of the horse so we can teach anatomy and physiology to our students and to all of you. The average horse size is anywhere from 14.3 to 16, 17, or even 18 hands tall. Uh, the average light horse that most people will ride, including quarter horses, Morgans, Appaloosas, is anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, depending, again, on their height and their overall size. The actual horse skeleton has a little over 200 bones. We're not going to go over all 200 bones today, however. We're going to go through two distinct general divisions of the horse skeleton. One is called the axial skeleton. I like to break down big things like 200 some odd bones of horses into smaller pieces. So we're going to break it down to two pieces. The axial skeleton starts at the head and includes all of the vertebrae, the cervical vertebrae of the neck, the thoracic vertebrae of the main part of the back, the ribs, and the ribs will connect through some cartilage to a breastbone or a sternum. That's the one bone that's missing from this body because the cartilage disintegrates when these bones were processed to actually construct the skeleton. So there is a breastbone just like we have, but it's not on the skeleton. So continuing with the axial skeleton, here's the thoracic vertebrae, the lumbar vertebrae. There's a fused set of five bones back here called the sacrum these are fused together and then obviously in horses you've got the tail vertebrae those are called coccygeal or caudal vertebrae and those vary in number depending on the breed and type of horse so that is the axial skeleton the second division of the skeleton of a horse is the appendicular skeleton or the appendages the front legs and the back legs so we'll start with the front legs and it's just like people 
you know, we're very comparison, comparable. We have a shoulder blade or a scapula. The horse has a scapula down to the humerus, which is the same as ours. They have an elbow, which is part of the ulna, but the ulna in horses is fused to the larger bone or the radius, which is our forearm bones. The carpal bones down here, which there are several of, equate to our wrist bones. Most people call this the knee, and that's lay terminology, which is fine as long as everybody understands what that is, but this is actually the equivalent of the wrist in the person. Then there's three bones down here that we'll go into more detail in another segment. Um, these are the metacarpal bones, the sesamoid bones, and then the phalanges, the uh, long pastern bone, the short pastern bone, and the coffin bone. So this is the front limb of the animal. The hind limb comes, starts back here with the pelvic girdle. And if you've ever been riding, and it's been a long time since you've been riding, and your seat bones are sore, that's the equivalent to this part of the skeleton on the horse. This is their seat bone, but they're a vertical, they're a horizontal animal and we're a vertical animal. Then the thigh bone, or the femur, which is the same as our thigh bone. This bone right here is the patella. And this, anatomically, is the knee, as it, equal, as it uh, equals the, the knee in a person. This large bone here is the tibia. And in people, we have a tibia, but we also have a fibula, which is on the outside or the lateral side of our leg those bones are fused in the horse. So they don't have two bones here, they just have one. And then you have the equivalent of our ankle with the hock, hock bones here. And then again, we'll go into more detail later on with the cannon bone or the third metatarsal bone, and then the long pastern bone, the short pastern bone, and the coffin bone. So that's just a general overview of the skeleton of the horse and we will get into more distinct pieces of the anatomy of the horse in a later segment. If you'd like more information, you can go to thehorse.com, talk to your veterinarian about different anatomical sites that you're interested in on the horse, and of course your public library is a very good source of information. Thank you for sharing this uh, time with me today and hope to see you in the next segment. Hello, I'm Dr. Roberta Dwyer. I'm a veterinarian at the Gluck Equine Research Center at the University of Kentucky. In this segment, we're going to talk specifically about the skull and some of its general anatomy and points of interest. So, on the skull, there's a, the broad, flat plane of the horse's forehead, and you can see here where the bony protection for the eye is, is pretty significant. The horse's eye is on the lateral side of the head, on the right and the left side. They are a prey animal. They have to worry about lions and tigers and cougars and panthers getting them when they're out in the wild. And so they have to be able to see almost 360 degrees around them. That's why these eyes are located on the lateral sides of their head. They do not see things that are directly under their, their lips and their teeth. They don't see humans that are standing right in front of them. That's why that's a dangerous place to stand. Uh, nor do they see directly behind their hind ends or their tail. But when they're down grazing, the way that their eyes are made can let them see quite a bit all the way around their body, especially if they're moving their head side to side. So there's quite a bit of protection here for the eye. Any eye injury in my book is an emergency. So if your horse is squinting, doing a lot of tearing, or there's pus coming out of the eye, they've got their heads in the back of the stall where it's dark, because they don't want to be exposed to light, you need to call your veterinarian and get them to look at that eye. So moving down, we have the maxilla, which is the upper jawbone, and we have the mandible, which is the lower jawbone, just like on people. Dentistry is a big part of veterinary medicine, and it's important to understand the anatomy of teeth. 
Horses have the same types of teeth that people have. They have incisors, which are used for grasping hay and forage. Then we have this uh, gap where there are no teeth. Many horses will have one canine tooth on the upper and the lower arcade. This particular skeleton does not have canine teeth. Then there's one, two, three premolars. And then moving up, there's one, two, three molars on the maxillary side and on the mandibular side. There is a unique feature to the teeth of horses. This is a broken off uh, cheek tooth of a horse. And when they're born, these teeth have a set length. And as the horse wears these teeth down or wears this surface down, they will continually erupt from the, the base of the tooth out so that there's always going to be a chewing surface until the horse gets up into his 20s where they're just going to run out of tooth, there's nothing more to erupt, and the horse loses that last piece of the premolar or molar. So that's a very unique feature to the horse, which is uh, interesting and scary at the same time because if you ever have to remove one of these teeth, you can see how deep into the, the bony structure that that root is. It's not just like taking a human molar or premolar out. There's a, that's an, a pretty extensive piece of surgery. So these teeth are often looked at on the outside because the maxillary teeth, the upper teeth, are wider than the mandible, which is a narrower uh, piece of bone. And just in the daily wear and tear of, of horses chewing, they're going to get sharp points on the outside of the upper arcade of teeth and they're going to potentially get sharp points on the inside of the mandibular teeth. And what a veterinarian will come out and do is take a rasp or an instrument and to shave off those points so they don't injure the tongue or the cheek of the horse because that can interfere with chewing, it can cause some weight loss and other issues with, um, with keeping their weight up because they have to be able to chew. They, uh, a total veterinary examination of the mouth will also be looking at these incisors because there's various different things that can happen with the anatomy of the horse and the way they wear those incisors at the same time. And so there might be some corrective procedures that need to be done there. Another important part of the horse's uh, skull anatomy, this is a piece of this nasal bone. And the thing to remember, even though this is a 26-year-old skeleton, which is very fragile and has a few fractures, the nasal bones of the horse do not go all the way down to its muzzle. That's why you never should hit a horse on the front part of its face, is because these bones, and this is part of this nasal bone that is broken off, you can see how thin that is and how shelly that bone is. So it's very easy to fracture, those types of fractures will probably cause quite a bit of bleeding and it's just they can accidentally break these uh, by running into objects but you never want to be hitting a horse on this part of its anatomy because these bones will fracture. So the bones, nasal bones on this horse actually only extend about three inches and they're all this you know very thin plated kind of bone. So that's something that some people don't understand, that this is all cartilage and connective tissue down here on the muzzle, and there is no bony structure beneath that. On this skeleton, you will see a lot of these little holes. These are called foramen. There's lots of them in the skull itself, and that's where nerves and blood vessels will come out of the bone to innervate different parts of the face. You'll find these throughout the skeleton of, of any animal's body. And these aren't drill holes, these are just these are natural openings that the body has for different vessels and nerves. So I look forward to joining you for another segment on another part of the anatomy of the horse. For more information, you can go to thehorse.com, internet resources, your veterinarian, and your local public library.
Hello, I'm Roberta DeWire. I'm an extension veterinarian at the Gluck Equine Research Center at the University of Kentucky. In this segment, we're going to be focusing on the bony anatomy of the front limb of the horse. Their anatomy and our anatomy of our arm versus their front limb is extremely similar. Horses have a shoulder blade, just like we do. The one absence in the horse skeleton versus the human skeleton is they don't have a collarbone. They don't have any bony attachment of the front limb to the rest of their body. The way this limb stays attached to the horse's body is through muscles, tendons, ligaments, and other connective tissue. So while we have a collarbone, which is a bony attachment of our arm to our body, the horse is all connective tissue. So here's a scapula, then we go down to the humerus, and if you consider this joint in the human, we can do a lot of different types of rotations and movement with that particular joint. How many times have you ever seen a horse do this with the front leg? That doesn't happen on a normal animal. That's because anatomically this joint is meant to go forward for locomotion, to move the front leg back, and to go minimally side to side. So for the dressage horses that are doing half passes, you know, those are the types of movements that this joint is actually doing. Here's the humerus. We have an elbow, horses have an elbow. Our elbow and the horse's elbow is attached to, is part of the bone called the ulna. And the ulna in the horse, obviously it starts out here at the elbow, but you can see it goes down to a very vestigial piece of the bone that's actually fused to the radius. We have a distinct ulna and radius, two separate bones. These are fused in the horse, a little bit different. So that's the forearm. The next set of bones is the equivalent to our wrist, although people will call this the knee, and these are carpal bones. There's two layers of carpal bones on the horse, and I always teach it from the medial or the inside of the animal going to the outside of the animal. The top row of carpal bones starts with a radial carpal bone, then the next bone here, which is right almost on midline, is the intermediate carpal bone, the ulnar carpal bone, which is on the lateral side, and the accessory carpal bone here. The next layer down also starts on the inside with the second carpal bone, the third carpal bone, and the fourth carpal bone. If we move down, we've got to our wrist. Now we go to the bones, of, long bones of the hand. In horses, everybody knows that this is the cannon bone, and that is the third metacarpal bone. Here on the inside is a nice splint bone, which we call the second metacarpal bone. The third metacarpal bone is the cannon, and on the lateral side is the fourth metacarpal bone. Now that's the equivalent of two, three, and four on the human hand. And you might say, where did one and five go? Over evolution, those particular bones um, disappeared. They, they've evolved now to where you've got splint bones and the main a huge weight-bearing bone and very dense bone of the cannon bone. Again, going south, we have two sesamoid bones, the medial and the lateral sesamoid bone. And what we generally know is the long pastern bone, the short pastern bone, and the coffin bone are actually the first, second, and third metacarpal bones in the horse. And you might say, isn't that enough? But there's one bone that we're missing that's very hard to get a picture of when you've got an entire skeleton like this, and that's the navicular bone, which is just behind uh, the coffin bone. And it's a slab-like bone. If you've heard of navicular disease, that is where this bone is, is within the hoof and can cause some problems on, with horses. So navicular disease, a lot of lamenesses with horses start in the hoof. Another area where they can have um, lameness, especially in young horses and athletes that are doing a lot of exercise and a lot of work, 
is with this metacarpal bone, there's a ligament that attaches it to the main cannon bone, and sometimes that ligament gets inflamed, sometimes there are, there's a partial or complete fracture of this particular bone, and that's commonly known as splints. So if you ever have a lameness in your horse and an abnormal swelling, heat in a joint or anywhere around the, the lower leg of an animal, that's the time to call your veterinarian. If you'd like to have more information on the anatomy of the horse's leg and other lamenesses, you can go to uh, thehorse.com, you can contact your veterinarian, and obviously use uh, the resources that you have at your local public library. I'm Roberta Dwyer. I'm a veterinarian at the Gluck Equine Research Center at the University of Kentucky here in Lexington. In this segment, we're going to cover the general anatomy of the hind limb of the horse. The hind limb of the horse actually starts with the pelvic girdle, and that is this whole set of bones. There's three bones. There's the ilium, there's the ischium, way back to the end here, and this bone here is called the pubis. That is one, there's three bones, but by the time the animal is an adult, they're fused into, you know, essentially one bone. From this pelvic girdle, we have the first long bone of the hind limb, which is the equivalent to our thigh bone. It's called the femur. This is a very large bone in the horse, obviously. And if you connect your thigh bone, connects to the knee bone or the patella. This is the actual knee, the human equivalent of a knee in the horse, whereas most people will call um, the front limb of the horse, the knee is up there. Anatomically, the knee of a horse and a human is the hind leg or the lower leg on a human. This is the patella. It slides up and down in this groove just like it does in people. Going further distally, we have the lower bones here, which is the tibia, which is this big bone and the large bone on our body. In dogs, cats, and people, and other animals, we also have a very thin bone on the outside of our leg called the fibula. The fibula is essentially fused to the tibia on the horse, so we just essentially call this the tibia on the horse. Just like in the human, the tibia is going to connect down to our ankle bones. These are called the tarsal bones. So these are the tarsal bones of the horse. This is the calcaneus. And this connects to the calcaneal tendon, which we know as the Achilles tendon. So it's a large tendon, and it is very important to the locomotion of the horse. So this is a calcaneus. This is the talus, this rounded bone here. And then there's a central tarsal bone. So this is the, the first row of tarsal bones in the horse. And then just like in the carpal bones in the front limb, you have the second tarsal bone, the third tarsal bone, and on this lateral side, the fourth tarsal bone. This is going to sound really familiar from the front leg where we have the metatarsals. Front limb is metacarpals, the hind limb are metatarsals. Splint bones, this is the second metatarsal bone. The cannon bone is the third metatarsal bone. And here on the lateral side is the fourth metatarsal bone, just like the long bones in our feet. Going farther down from here, we have the two sesamoids, the medial sesamoid, which is here, the lateral sesamoid, which is on the outside of the animal, which is here. And again, this is going to look real familiar, the long pastern bone, the short pastern bone, and the coffin bone, or the first, second, and third phalanx, just like in the front limb of the horse, and again, we have the navicular bone, which is just caudal to the coffin bone. So this is the general anatomy of the hind limb of the horse. If you need more information, you can go to thehorse.com, contact your veterinarian, and use resources on the internet and also at your public library.
It's incredible that such matchstick legs survive the crushing impact each time they hit the ground. By placing a forelimb in a press, we'll see the stresses it undergoes as the horse accelerates to a gallop. OK, we're in the jig now. Joy, do you want to start pumping? So now this would be starting to take some load when it's walking and carrying the weight on there. Yes, if you feel the tendons, you can feel that they're under load. They're getting like a piece of taut wire. Very taut. You've got one there, a second one there, the deeper one. Yep. So you've got big, solid yep. bands. And they're coming all the way down from up here on the, on the elbow and all the way down to the foot. We're probably looking like trotting at the moment. So the cannon bone is actually getting the load of these tendons and the weight, compressing it and bending it, because the tendons are trying to bend it like a bow backwards. So this is like the bow and that's the string? Yes. Can we load this a bit more to see what happens when it would be at full gallop? Yep. How low would that fitlock get? It will come down to about here. Wow. Just listen for cracking. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. And well, stop in there. No, keep going. Keep going further than that. Yep. I can't believe how much that's spent. That is extraordinary. The tendon is 20 or 30 times better than a steel spring in storing energy. A horse's leg works like a pogo stick, compressing and recoiling. When a leg hits the ground, the downward forces cause the fetlock joint to drop to an almost horizontal position, absorbing some of the shock. Tendons running down the back of the leg act like springs, stretching to allow the joint to drop, but preventing it from collapsing. The stretch tendons store elastic energy, which propels the leg into the next stride. This allows the horse to move as fast as possible, expending the least amount of energy, while cushioning the leg from impact. So, Alan, we've now got a leg at gallop, fully loaded. What if another leg hits the back of the tendon through the very thin skin? Oh, that tendon's under load and it's, it will really break quite easily. I'll just, with a scalpel, come around the back here. Wow. And what that's fun. what would happen in your overbeats. Wow. End of racing career. But when this is working as it's supposed to, this is a beautiful piece of engineering. Absolutely superb. We don't have the sort of materials in engineering that we do in biology.
horses are the ultimate athlete, performing incredible feats. Musculoskeletal systems of modern day sport horses are pushed to their physiological extremes. Whatever the discipline, muscles, tendons, fascia, bone and joints are all put under excessive stress, strain, force and torsion. This can increase the risk of joint damage and osteoarthritis. In this video, I hope to share with you some tips and appropriate exercises that help to reduce the stress and strain on joints. Correct way of going. Good posture and balance whilst carrying the weight of the rider is really important and goes a long way to reduce the stress and strains placed on joints. Walking on roads is good for stimulating and hardening bones. But avoid too much trotting on roads as this increases concussion and jarring. Backing up is a superb exercise to stimulate the postural muscles and those involved in maintaining good back posture whilst carrying the weight of the rider. Basically, it's like collection in reverse as the horse shifts his weight back onto the hindquarters, strengthening those hindquarter muscles. Ideally, the horse should be encouraged to take long, marching steps backwards. Maintaining the diagonal pair movement, keeping the head down, and try for 10 to 20 steps backwards every day to have a really good effect. Movement of joints helps to stimulate the production of synovial fluid, which is vital for joint health. Therefore, it's really good to take all of the horse's joints through as full and varied range of movement as often as possible. It's like the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. And variety is the spice of life. Pole work is a superb way of encouraging the horse to use a full range of movement in different joints. A series of raised walk poles like this will encourage the horse to stimulate core muscle recruitment as well as moving his joints, but in a careful and controlled manner. Raised trot poles encourage symmetry as the horse has to push evenly from behind. And canter poles really help to increase the amount of flexion and extension, rounding and hollowing within the horse's back. If the horse is confined to a stable, it's important to keep the joints as mobile as possible. There are a variety of different passive joint mobilizations which we can do to help the horse maintain suppleness and are beneficial for maintaining range of movement. Joint supplements, especially those that have a combination of glucosamine and chondroitin, with guaranteed bioavailability, and that bit's important, can help to maintain joint mobility, reduce joint stiffness, and help with osteoarthritis. Make sure you choose a joint supplement that's recommended by vets and is backed by scientific trials. Many of them aren't. Joint supplements will be most effective in very mobile joints. For example, in the foot, fetlock, knee, stifle, hop and hip. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found the tips useful. Watch out for more in the future.